Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Um, so before starting the presentation and going in the meat of it, I thought I have a few comments about what we have done over the last few years. Um, it's been about five years since I was with you guys at the San Diego meeting, and um, we want to get a bit more active in the community. So I hope this gives you some context of what we might be able to contribute. Um, so first, my lab um, is consisting of a diverse set of people um, having a lot of different interests. So we're working in a variety of areas, but I think the tools that we are applying and the lessons that we glean from it, they transfer very well into what the open posture group is trying to achieve. So I'm going to run through a couple of these projects and make some comments also relevant to the discussion we had last night about the um, machine learning and AI and structural biology and chemistry. So um, in my lab, we are working on lab automation, drug discovery, potion engineering, augmented topology. Um, and we are also in this consortium, which I'm running, which is called the Consortium of Molecular Designs. We're trying to have very close test and build cycles together with chemical engineers and biology colleagues. Um, so our journey into AI really started in 2018 when I attended the CAS 13 conference right after getting the academic position. And then shortly thereafter, we had the San Diego meeting for the Open Postures group. And um, there we were just done recreating Alpha Fold 1. It was sort of our Hello World um, problem where we tried to democratize something that didn't seem to become an open source solution at that point. And so we published a couple of reports on it. And one I wanted to point out because if you have, you have asked me about it is um, this one where we have shown that if you take two amino acid sequences that are very similar to each other, they only have a couple of point mutations difference, um, some neural networks are actually able to get the structural differences right. And so here we showed that the crossbar network was able to get the context correctly predicted for the different folds, which was something that Rosetta Fold, for example, couldn't do at that point. Um, and then there were a few other articles. One thing that we were really interested in understanding is if these type of deep learning models infer any insights about physics. And while looking at it, we realized, no, that's not the case, because deep learning is always some sort of shortcut learning. It will always exploit some underlying bias and transition that from your training data into the um, test data, and hopefully it generalizes, but it won't necessarily use anything physical to get to its conclusion. Um, yeah, so the code is out. It was our first attempt to be open source and do some things. Uh, when we find after what's published their reports, they kind of mentioned it. So we hope we have a little historical footnote that maybe we have a little bit reshaping their publication strategy and making um, some of their outcomes publicly accessible. Um, after that, we thought, well, what do you do when you do machine learning? Um, the standard problems are multi docking and doing cancer identification. It seems to be always the first application everyone gets their hands dirty on. So what we have tried to do is to go one step beyond classical docking tools by saying, hey, there's so many docking tools, they all have different random number generators at the end. So maybe there is a signal there if we build a consensus model that uses machine learning to find the underlying pattern. So we trained a machine learning model called MIPDOC that uses five um, classical force fields and uses all of the um, terms that come out of them. So a set of about 50 features, um, run set for a shallow neural network, and then was able to differentiate quite well, at least on our test data set. Um, between actives and decoys, and we're currently applying that actively in the cache challenge that some of you are aware of, and we have used it now on enamine and zinc. Um, it's pretty expensive when you run that many docking tools, so not everyone is excited about it, but we hope that there will be some results that motivate using it going forward. Um, I'm personally very excited about the work the Open Free Energy Group is doing, and I hope that we can contribute with this pipeline to it and help with the benchmarking efforts there. Um, then with regards to image annotations, everyone wants to build a really nice image classifier for cats and dogs. It works wonderfully because we can agree what they look like. When you ask pathologists about cancer types, there's a lot less consensus in the room. And so why for the last 15 years has no one been able to put a clinical approved um, prostate cancer machine learning model into operation? It's a good question. We wrote a review paper. It's about to come out. Um, where we show that the problem is really that there are no unbiased data sets. And the bias that exists between a pathologist looking at an image in this orientation and that, that orientation is as bad as the difference between a uh, pathologist and the best AI that we can have today. 
So very interesting. It opens up the question to what type of data sets do you need to use if there is bias in the data and you want to capture something that has clinical relevance. And I think there are some insights learned here that can transfer in our machine learning situations as well. Um, we're also doing some more classical bioengineering. Uh, so here's a study where we looked at a biosensor that has a very broad ligand spectrum, and we tried to reduce the ligand spectrum by rational design. So we ran some docking on it, found some active site neighbors that seemed like potentially relevant, created the library and then tested it. And we found one point mutation that was able to become inactive for a specific substrate. So making that sense a little bit more specific. Uh, the reason I'm presenting it here is because after the rational design, we run and these simulations over it because the crystal structure solved for both looked exactly the same. So the question is, why is the difference in behavior and the MD simulations? They showed that there's a shift in the Boltzmann ensemble of confirmations, and that is really what determines the function here. And so when we talk about alpha fold 2 or some of the structure-based models, we are just not at the end of the journey yet because it's not enough to get static structures. We really need to go into structural ensembles and probabilities of structures given whatever conditions might be present in the cell in order to fully understand what the protein does. Um, so that led us to the question of what can we do with machine learning in the field of enzyme design? Uh, we just a video paper on that and found that um, it's a very hard problem. So pretty much everyone tries and gives up. And machine learning, at least in 2021, was very limited in its application. So we started working in that field, and we applied some large language models. So by now, there are a few other tools out, like Protein MPNN, for example. Sergey Ovchenikov is doing a lot. Baker is doing a lot again. Um, but when we investigated these models, we realized that there's a bit of a systematic error in there. Because when you look at the... Um, learning objective that these models have is they always try to take a structural confirmation and try to optimize the free energy around that confirmation completely ignoring the rest of the energy landscape and so there's a high chance that you find the structure that's maybe very optimized but it does also have a different energy minima and then you can get misformers and uh, misfolding events and so when you look into the um, reports you can find that people are always surprised that why the natural language model is giving you such a great idea of where to go it works only in a certain percentage of the cases and our hypothesis is that there are actually alternative confirmations that are being also optimized and people are not aware of it because the learning um, objective is just not properly defined and so this uh, preprint which hopefully is going to come out soon the journal um, we show that there is a way of rectifying that by using base rule and by um, Doing some tricks to the way we use these language models. And uh, we applied that to an enzyme in Nanulu and were able to stabilize it over a wide range of temperatures, which um, gives us a good idea that this model might be able to help with the hard task of protein engineering in the future. What it really showed us, though, is that if you bring people in a room, and also the um, digital pathology showed us that, that have a very strong machine learning background they might be able to do a really nice job of giving you an architecture that predicts something that's very accurate, but it is just not the right objective function. Because if you don't have the domain expertise and know all the implications of it and what else could be happening, it's very easy to be misled and go for something that has absolutely no relevance. Like a kappa value of one when you train an uh, AI model for a cancer classification where the data set was created by one pathologist on data set from one hospital at completely ignoring the heterogeneity that you normally have when you uh, travel across the country and ask multiple pathologists. Great machine learning model, people publish it, but at the end of the day, no one will use it because it just won't generalize to the domains that you care about. And the same thing can happen in biological systems as well. So we need to bring together people that have domain expertise as well as the machine learning and math background to get these models to work. Um, then CAS 14 happened. And uh, I was really invested into the Trustbelt product, and we thought we could make this something that would uh, revolutionize the field, had some nice attempts to improve on it. And then, of course, um, AlphaFold 2 uh, put us all into shock. Uh, during the conference, we created this little self-help group to meet once a week and kind of overcome the stress of having the likelihood of our fundings completely destroyed. I'm actually called it OpenFold. 
Um, and we had a weekly meeting trying to understand what is it that makes Alpha Core 2 so great. We had a lot of external speakers come in. Um, Fabian Fuchs talked us about the SE3 transformer, and we were wrenching into these uh, mystical fields of math and physics and how to integrate them until eventually we realized that Alpha Fold talked a little bit more about what could have been done than what they actually did. Um, the interesting thing is, of course, that these concepts like SE3 variants are very powerful and can be used in other contexts. Um, however, in these discussions, we realized that retraining Alpha Fold 2 would be too expensive for the resources that we had. I checked this morning who is left from the group, and the only one left in our Slack channel was Mohammed. Um, I guess he liked open fold, so he stuck with it afterwards. Um, good. We um, stuck with equivariance instead. Um, one thing maybe that I learned, and one of you pointed it out to me, is that if I come up with good names, I should do a better job of announcing them to people. And so um, here's the model of our lab. We call it the data rhinos um, because we created this integrated data science path at BYU, where we take students that are very promising STEM students, like Bryce, who is co presenting with me. He worked with me on the Prosper model since 2018, um, and then give them the ability to work in consortia, ideally with industry partners together, so that they come out at the end with a degree where they have a data science applied background that helps them to become a real contributors for the rest of their career. And so I like the tagline, we're creating unicorns, only real ones, tougher ones, right? So I don't like the puny little mystical animal with that little neck and the big horn, and just need to stay when data rhymes. That's great. Um, anyway, so one thing we also did is we um, were very heavily invested in a company called Zonto that does lab automation. Um, chief science officer that organization we were just acquired by Brooker two weeks ago which is nice because it gives us some funding routes that I didn't have before. And so um, due to that, I'm able to find the consortium that can design a little bit better at BYU and, for example, contribute Bryce for the next three years to the Open Force Field Initiative and have them um, work with you some projects that will hopefully enable science on a larger scale. Can I ask you to be a little bit closer to that? Yes, for sure. I forgot that I'm picked up somewhere. Um, okay, so, but what we really took away from these um, CASP 14 results was that the idea of inductive bias is super important. And when we train machine learning networks, the way we can go a level beyond what everyone can do is by putting some hard math and physics into it. And so what we did then with Fabian Fuchs together is took one of his SE3 transformers and pimp it up a bit. He had trained it on the terrible uh, QM9 data set, if I can quote John from yesterday. Um, and we retrained it on the ANI-1 data set. And just to show that this will be able to give us a nicer performance. And the initial results look pretty good. So we presented it at an Europe site event. Um, and today we're gonna show you what happened in the next iteration of that network. Before pointing that out, I just wanna also highlight a different area of application because the question came up yesterday, when will ML replace normal MD simulations? for force fields in our domain, I don't know in our domain, but we wrote a review paper on what happens in the field of molecular, uh, of molecular simulations for molten salts. And in that area, we see an exponential growth of purely ML-based simulations because they need to have very polarizable force fields and you can only get that with AIMD. And all this up initio stuff is always limited to 100 atoms, few picosecond simulations. It's not enough to get them the thermophysical properties that they want. And so they're applying right now all types of crazy potentials that have a bunch of underlying systematic errors. So one thing that they love to do is um, run an MD simulation, an ap, uh, ap initio, a DFT one, um, and then they fit a Bela Parinello um, system on it, which was optimized for single atomic types. And when you read the literature, you will always see them say, this works great for two species uh, molten salt, but when they go to four or five atomic species, it completely breaks because the input vectors are hard-coded to correspond to an average chemical environment, which obviously shifts inside of the simulation box. Um, but they haven't quite caught up on that yet. And so I think that uh, collaborating with the Open Force Field Group can help us transferring some of the insights that you have developed and best practices into that field and hopefully help this vertical domain also to make progress. Um, but with this, I'm going to transfer over to Bryce so he can tell you a bit more about the new model of TRIP. 
Yeah, so the TRIP was the next iteration of our SE3 transformer-based neural network. Um, so in context, there's there's a ton of different neural network potentials. For example, Schnett, Bailey Polynalo, Annie. Um, but the majority of these neural networks, um, they only work with scalar type features, which for molten salt simulations, you need polarizable force builds, um, which can't, uh, which aren't able to, which um, the scalar networks can't predict the dipole moments correctly. Um, and another big limitation of these is that a lot of them require on um, handcrafted input features um, using symmetry functions. Um, so what we wanted to do is instead work with an equivariant type neural network, um, which um, has a lot stronger math, which has a very strong mathematical foundation based off of spherical tensors. Um, which which transform covariantly under rotation. Um, so an example of why these are useful is uh, equivariance is a principle that allows physical properties to be encoded. So for example, in this figure in the bottom um, right, um, it diagrams what exactly um, equivariance can mean. So uh, if you go down, then you calculate forces on a molecular system and then go right, you can rotate those forces, but you end up getting the same forces as if you had first rotated the system um, and then evaluated the forces. Um, so you can generalize this beyond just vectors to higher um, higher order geometrical objects, uh, the, the, these tensors that we work with. Um, so um, we're, just to say, we're not the first ones that have done this. Other people have also been working on this, um, but our method is more general than, um, for example, MECWIP. Uh, which just work with tensor field networks. Um, our method uses SD3 transformers, which also incorporate attention mechanisms, um, which allows it to then have angular degrees of freedom in addition to the radial degrees of freedom. So some of the features of our network is we trained it on the ANI 1X data set, which supports carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen species. And we use an atom agnostic architecture, which is something that we don't really see many other people do. And what I mean by an atom agnostic is that the majority of our parameters are shared between atomic species. The only um, atomic species dependent layer is the atomic embed the species embedding. Um, and this allows it to then um, work for many different species in the future when we want to transport to transfer it to new systems, for example, molten salts. Um, the problem with like Baylor polynello is that as you increase the atomic species, um, the input vector in increases dramatically and so does your parameter count. So by having this species agnostic architecture, you're able to limit the parameters and then also um, allow information to be generalized between atomic species. Um, another thing that we added is we, we have um, added correct atomization energy and repulsion. Um, as someone mentioned yesterday, if you run with any um, potentials, you can end up with fusion. And we've corrected that by adding a nuclear repulsion term. Um, and then we also added an atomization energy so that the, your molecules don't fall apart during simulation and to help um, with the areas that might not have been trained by data. We, um, we bias it by using our physical knowledge of how the system should behave. And then the last thing that we added, um, the last feature we have is that our network is smooth. Um, and I say this in the mathematical sense that our derivatives and all their derivatives, um, they're, all smooth, they're all continuous. And that helps prevent some of the instabilities that you have with other neural network potentials. Um, so we benchmarked our network on what's called the COMP6 benchmarking set. And this um, generalizes beyond uh, the molecules that are in the training set. So it has larger molecules that the network was be trained on. So it really gives you an idea of how well your network can generalize beyond um, the molecules it was trained on. Um, that's one of the things that a lot of the network potentials um, struggle with now is that they're trained on a very small um, uh, collection of molecules, just in different confirmations in the test set. It's just different confirmations of the same molecule. But to have a general potential, you want to be able to say, how will this potential work on molecules it's never seen? And we find that our network performs better than um, Annie1x, Annie1, all the other published methods. And we're really excited about that because um, it means that we're going in the right direction and that our, our architecture has potential. We also did energy surface scans of H2O. Um, and this kind of diagrams what I was saying earlier about the atom atomization energies and the nuclear repulsion, because 
if you look at that, all three of the these different methods for calculating the energies, they all have the same uh, similar uh, same uh, similar minimum around uh, one angstrom. Um, but if you look at any, if you go smaller than one angstrom, then it actually doesn't have the repulsion term that you would expect from physically. Um, but like DFT does, but our method does have that because we have hard coded that into our architecture. And then another issue is that if you start pulling it apart, then you end up with another minimum, which isn't physically um, realistic, but our potential overcomes that issue by having the correct atomization energy. We also did a torsion, did a torsion scan of ephedrine, and we found that our method got slightly higher RMSE values, um, and that we were able to predict the correct structure of the torsion scan. Um, we're hoping to benchmark it on the bigger data set of torsion scans that was introduced yesterday, though. And then we also ran MD simulations using our different using different potentials. We used the Amber 14 with the tip three water, uh, and then also anti one X and trip potentials using um, solvated models uh, that and the water molecules, their forces and potent, and energies are actually predicted by the networks rather than tip three. Uh, we find that we're able to simulate the molecules for 20 nano seconds um, and then get a good understanding of the statistical landscape um, of the um, MD, uh, the MD um, system. So we calculated different MD statistics of the secondary structures. Um, what, what are the, the average phi psi angles? What's the uh, standard deviation of those? And then how often is each of these uh, potentials, how often do they predict that it should be in um, one secondary structure versus another. And we found that the annual one X, um, it's, it sampled um, regions of the, the Ramachandra plot that generally aren't accessible, uh, but our, our approach um, limited, the, um, limited mainly to um, the more common Ramachandran areas. Um, yeah. So going forward, we're hoping to apply it to enzymes. I'm going to um, pass it back to Dennis. Just a quick conclusion. So uh, thanks, Bryce. I think the potential has a lot of potential. Um, the question is now, which data set do we need to train it on to get something really important out of it? One thing we hope is that by teaming up with Open Force Field, some groups from the uh, molten salt community will feel more um, inclined to share their trajectories. Right now, everyone runs these expensive trajectories and locks them up, which I think is a waste. We could train on those and then really expand the network to different atomic species. Um, like Bryce mentioned, transfer learning is completely possible. You don't have to retrain anything. You take the model as is and fine tune it on the next atomic species, and it shouldn't lose its ability to work on the initial data set. Um, yeah, and then of course it opens up the door to reactive force fields, which I'm really interested in for the case of enzyme design. Uh, we have done so much enzyme simulations and tried to work with the QMMM simulations. It's always a pain being able to have one force field that does the reaction of the active uh, site correctly, but then also models the water molecules correctly without being dependent on some other integration is uh, is a powerful promise. We have to see where it really leads in the future. So with that, I just want to point out that I'm excited about collaboration. If you have some data sets where you'd like to try to uh, try this out, we can train that guy very rapidly. It takes a couple of days on our YouTube cluster, um, and then we can quickly give you some benchmarks on that. And we hope that together we'll define some best practices that will inform our collaborators and colleagues in domains that have not yet the 40 years-ish of experience that we have with uh, water models and solvents here. So with that, I'm at the end of the presentation. Thank you for your attention.